Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. Um, let me start out with congratulations to the community at the University of Nevada for taking the initiative to address this really critically important topic and to uh, Mick Hitchcock and others for uh, facilitating the opportunity to have the conversation we want to have today. I want to talk today about dealing with climate change in a world that's fundamentally out of time, but I want to do it with a spirit of guarded optimism, a recognition that we have a family of technologies and strategies that we can use to solve the problem, but we also have a troubling history of acting way too slowly to take full advantage of the technologies that are already richly available. And the journey I want to take you on today is a conversation about how we got to where we are, what the solutions look like, and how we can deploy them more effectively in the future. A statement from the most recent report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, kind of the um, entity that the world scientists have set up to advise the world's governments. And they concluded in their 2021 report that it's unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean and land, widespread and rapid changes in the atmosphere, ocean, cryosphere, and biosphere have already occurred. A sobering statement about where we are. And when you look at the data, there's no question that temperatures are hot. I mean, 2022 was actually the, the sixth warmest year in the record, but all 10 of the 10 warmest years have occurred in the last 10. Troublingly, emissions of carbon dioxide, the main greenhouse gas, are also up in, in 2022 after, a, after a, a steep spike in 20. 20 uh, associated with the global pandemic. And some people have interpreted that 2020 drop as an indication that maybe emissions had peaked. But for me, the, the most troubling aspect of the drop is the confirmation that there's still a operational link between global economic activity and CO2 emissions. That's the link we need to break. And when we look at impacts, it, it's clear that we're now in a world where, where we're just seeing impacts on a, on a daily basis. This is um, temperatures in, uh, in the American West in September of last year, when I think it was almost as hot here as it was in the, in the Bay Area, and where we're just shattering records uh, on, a, on a frequent basis. On the other hand, it's also clear that opportunities are way up. Those are opportunities for deploying energy solutions, opportunities for doing a better job of managing natural resources to adapt to the climate changes that we don't avoid, and opportunities for cooperating internationally to deliver climate solutions. This is a, a photograph at the conclusion of the negotiations that led to the 2015 Paris Agreement. Okay, what I, what I want to do today is, is talk a little bit about the evidence that climate change is real and we're causing it. Put it in the historical context of uh, what sets the pace for when we need to deliver solutions. Talk about how that leads to a pretty clear understanding of how much time we have to deliver those solutions. And then talk about what the solutions look like. Let me start with the evidence that humans are causing climate. And, and I think we're kind of out of the era where this needs to be the, the primary topic for discussion. But it's really striking when you look back at our understanding of the physics that are driving climate change and appreciate that that understanding has been in place for well over a century. It's also clear that, that uh, we understand the way climate works well enough to have a very accurate quantitative match between the observations and the expectations. We have definitive fingerprints that really confirm that the changes we're seeing are caused by the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and not by other mechanisms. And when you look at all the other hypotheses that have been proposed to, 
explain even a small fraction of the warming that's occurred to date. Uh, none of them stand up to the challenges of really being based on evidence. And I just want to show one uh, small piece of evidence, and I, I realize it's very small on this screen, but this is the, the cover page of an 1896 paper by the brilliant Swedish uh, chemist Svante Arrhenius, who talked about the amount of warming we would expect from a doubling of carbon dioxide associated with burning coal. And in 1896, so what is that, 127 years ago, Arrhenius knew the three things that you need to know in order to make an accurate calculation of the climate sensitivity of carbon dioxide. He knew carbon dioxide was a greenhouse gas, <coughs> approximately how much energy it absorbs. He knew that if you emit a bunch of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, it'll partition between dissolving the oceans, making it more acid, and staying in the atmosphere. And he also knew that a warmer atmosphere will hold more water vapor and that water vapor also was a heat trapping gas amplifying the effect of the CO2. Based on those three things, well known and not really contested since the end of the 19th century, Arrhenius was able to come up with a relatively accurate estimate of how much warming we should expect with the doubling of CO2. And I think that really uh, puts the understanding of the, of the physics in context. It also is impressive how well we've been able to simulate the relationship between greenhouse gases and climate change in quantitative models. So this is based on the IPCC third assessment report published in 2001, 22 years ago. And I don't know if you can see it on here, but there's a, a vertical dashed line that distinguishes between uh, the hindcast part of the, of the experiment, the analysis, and the, and the forecast part. The solid black line was the estimate from IPCC scientists about uh, the way the models were reconstructing past climate and projecting the future. And the squiggly colored lines are all the reconstructions of the global average temperature of the land and the oceans. And you can see that in 2001, 22 years ago, the forward-going projections pretty much nailed the actual trajectory of climate for what scientists at that point thought was the most likely future evolution. So it was essentially in terms of predicting the global outcomes, we were bang on, essentially 100% accurate. Those of you who, who follow Science Magazine will have noted that uh, a couple weeks ago, there was a paper arguing that uh, scientists at ExxonMobil knew this as well, and that their internal calculations were pretty much the same as those from the rest of the scientific community, emphasizing how widely understood all this stuff has been over, over a long period. And we're seeing consequences. I, 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 I used to spend uh, significant fraction of a talk like this talking about the, the impacts of climate change. But now I think we're seeing them so frequently in our everyday lives that we don't really need to talk about them that much. This is uh, NOAA's accounting of the billion dollar disasters in the US in 2022. There were 18, the, the um, record is, is 22 billion dollar disasters. So it wasn't the record, but uh, we're seeing event after event that has a clear climate change component, whether it's uh, western drought or Gulf Coast hurricanes. A very large fraction of the billion dollar events have, have climate change somewhere at their core. The way the IPCC characterizes these impacts is to try to summarize them in a number of different buckets that that allow us to take a, a really broad view. And, and, and I like the view because it's in many ways more informative than, than one that takes a purely economic perspective on the issues. And so based on the historical warming and reasonable expectations about what future emissions might be, we have a reasonable chance of 
ending the century with a warming that's anywhere from 1.5 Celsius, a little less than, than uh, 3 Fahrenheit, all the way up to more than 4 Celsius, or almost 9 degrees Fahrenheit. And when you, when you juxtapose those with what we understand about impacts, you can see the motivation for stabilizing warming at the low end of the trajectory. The, um, uh, the IPCC bundles climate impacts into these, into five areas that I think are really useful to think about, both in terms of having a formal accounting of damages and for thinking about why we care about climate change. The, the rightmost bar is risk to unique systems, rare and endangered species, heritage sites, culturally important zones, um, cultures that are on low-lying islands. And you can see that, that risks uh, rapidly transition from uh, moderate to high to very high for these unique and threatened systems. The second one is risk from extreme events, the thing we were just talking about. And uh, one of the things that's most difficult for the climate models to project, but we have an increasingly clear understanding of the relationship between warming at the global scale and extreme events at the local scale. Again, with risk gradually increasing from uh, moderate at, at amounts of warming we've already seen to, to extreme. Uh, the, the middle one is called distributional issues. And these are the extent to which the risks of a changing climate really impact the most vulnerable among us the most, the poorest among us the most, and those who are uh, least responsible in most cases for causing the challenges. These distributional impacts are expected to kick in in a big way at slightly higher temperatures than the uh, risk to unique and threatened systems, but they do kick in really profoundly by the time we're at um, 2C above pre-industrial. Actually, let me uh, add the, the temperature markers. So 1.5C, 2C, and 2.5C. The, the fourth bar is global aggregate effects. What are the effects of warming on the global economy, and overall biological diversity, overall access to freshwater resources? We tended in the early phases of our analysis of climate impacts to really focus on these aggregate impacts. And we know that they're an important part of the picture, but they're far from the complete picture. And then the last bar is, it's called uh, singular events, which I think is a, a, a uniquely non-descriptive way to characterize the big tipping points that we really worry about. What happens if we have a, a major collapse of the Antarctic ice sheet? Or what happens if there's a massive release of uh, methane and carbon dioxide from currently frozen soils. And the IPCC characterized risks as uh, not detected, moderate, high, and, and very high. The, the way to think about these is that moderate risks, those shown in yellow, are ones where we're really pretty sure that adaptation can provide a set of solutions that work for almost everybody. Red, the risks that are shown as high, are ones where we really don't know uh, whether adaptation can address the needs. And purple, the risks that are shown as very high, are those where we're really pretty sure that we can't adapt. And when we look at uh, which category of risks we're in, at, at 1.5, we are beginning to transition from the red to the purple on, on unique systems. Uh, by the time we look at 2C, we're solidly in the purple for the unique one-off systems, and we're beginning to transfer transition in the area of extreme events. And by, by 2.5, we're solidly in the red across all five categories, and solidly in the purple on the two most sensitive categories, the, the unique and threatened systems and the, um, the extreme events. A as you know, the Paris Agreement is to stabilize warming at well below 2C with an effort to pursue uh, stabilization at 1.5. I'm going to explain why, why I don't think stabilization at 1.5 is, is any longer possible, but why stabilization below or near 2 is, is really essential. And 
in order to do that, I, I have to do the wonkiest part of the comments I want to make. And this figure from the IPCC report is essentially the documentary evidence about why we're running out of time. So this is the relationship between the amount of warming that occurs and the total cumulative amount of CO2 that's emitted from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution until the time when we emit the last ton. And th there are two really important things about this figure, which shows the historical evolution of temperature and the, the, in the black line and the future evolution in the colored lines. And, and there are two really important things to note. One is that there's pretty close to a straight line relationship between the total amount of greenhouse gases that are emitted forever and the total amount of warming. And there's the implication, even more important, that if we want to stop warming, we need to s not only decrease emissions of greenhouse gases, but bring those emissions to zero. And that's a really challenging reframing of the climate issue. And it's one that we're just beginning to confront. It also highlights why we're so close to out of time. Um, if you want to say, for example, we want to limit warming to 1.5 Celsius, you can simply look up on this figure what the total cumulative emissions can be that are consistent with that. And um, f where I've drawn the lines are to have a, have a two-thirds probability of, of limiting warming to that. Uh, we, can, we can do the same exercise for, for any level of warming. But uh, let's just talk about 1.5 C for for another minute, and the, the total amount of forever budget implied in the figure I just showed you is, um, can't read from the side, about 2,800 billion tons of CO2. Through 2022, we emitted about 2,511 billion tons of CO2, and in the amount that's left is just the little slice at the top there. And it's um, on the order of 300 billion tons. In 2022, the emissions were just over 40 billion tons. Simple math to say how many years at current emissions do we have until we pass that threshold. We're committed to a warming of at least 1.5 C. And if we were to continue emissions at the current pace, we would hit this 1.5 C level in less than seven years. And frustratingly, you could write down on your calendar that July of 2029 is when we would expect to pass the threshold. Now, uh, my, my Stanford colleague, Noah Diffenbaugh, just on Monday published a, a beautiful paper analyzing this in, in more quantitative detail using a, uh, a AI-based interpretation of a whole bunch of climate model results but came to essentially the same conclusion for the 1.5 degree threshold, what's the year at which we're most likely to pass it. And it's, a, it's at the peak of each of these curves for um, low, medium, and high emission scenario. And you can see that in general, the, the um, peak based on this analysis is in the, in the late 2030. So a little bit later than what I showed based on the idea that emissions would continue. This is based on the idea that emissions start decreasing consistent with the IPCC scenarios. And for the, for the 2C threshold, uh, that time is, is shifted out to about 2050, but is still very, very close to upon us. Uh, the frustrating way I think about it is that for the 1.5C threshold, we've already used up about half of the time that was available to us in 2015 when the Paris Agreement was signed. So uh, why, what got us where we are? I, I think there are three phases of, uh, sort of characterization of the status of, of action on climate. And, and the first phase was one where progress was really limited by denial, by, by assertions not evidence-based, but assertions that the change wasn't happening. Um, one of the most iconic images of this was the, uh, 
Jim Inhofe, the senator from Oklahoma, bringing a snowball into the Senate and uh, arguing that because there was snow in Washington, we couldn't have climate change. A after the science was so solid that, that an denial wasn't really a defensible strategy, we, we were in an era where you could legitimately argue that the problem was just too expensive to try to solve. We, we couldn't imagine doing it. And, and if you look at the cost trajectory uh, for solar PVs, y you can see how dramatically that's changed. Th this figure starts in 1977 when producing one watt from a solar panel was going to cost you uh, north of $70. And in 2015, that was less than 50 cents. So more than a hundredfold decrease in the, in the cost per watt of solar panels and, and indicating that you know, we're clearly now out of the era where, where upfront expense is the limiting factor. And I think the era that we're now in is in some ways a very promising one, but it's a still a challenging one and it's one I would characterize as being driven by different sources of friction. Um, this, is, this is protesters who are protesting an offshore wind farm off of, off of Cape Cod. And increasingly what we're seeing is that the factors that are slowing deployment of the solutions we know can work are concerns about siting, um, concerns about impacts on vulnerable communities, whether they're native species of plants or, or tortoises or lizards, or, um, or whether they're displaced people, and, and friction from vested incumbents who are pleased to stay with a system we've got and, and see advantages in, in foot dragging on solutions. The, the really interesting aspect, though, of the era of friction that we're in now is that in general, the entities on all sides of the issue agree that the fundamentals of climate change are real and important, and that we need to be working together on solutions. And questions of whether the utility scale PV ought to be here or over here, uh, whether a mine should be located in Nevada or Utah, those are, are relatively fine scale questions that are susceptible to negotiation. And in my institute, we've been working recently to grow kind of a grand bargain between hydropower producers and river conservation entities and have really demonstrated that groups with very different historical orientations can come together around climate solutions. And that's basically what I want to talk about from here on out. Uh, you know, the way, the way I think about it is that we traditionally thought that if we had a dollar to invest, we could invest it in mitigation, decreasing emissions of greenhouse gases, or in adaptation, coping with the changes we can't avoid, or in growing the economy. And, and at least in the modeling, those three things were, were viewed as, as alternatives that were essentially non-overlapping. But as we've seen the technologies develop, what we see is increasingly they really do overlap. And there's a sweet spot where we can look at single families of technologies that are delivering mitigation benefits, adaptation benefits, jobs benefits, economic growth benefits, and environmental justice benefits simultaneously. So that's the, that's the optimism and the message I want to present. And now I want to talk about how we get there. The frustrating piece of the message that I want to communicate today is that we almost certainly are not going to stabilize warming at 1.5 C. We're simply too much on the threshold. When the, when the IPCC looked at this five years ago, they concluded that it wasn't technically impossible to stabilize warming at 1.5, but it was really, really difficult and required a globally coordinated, amplified approach that we haven't, we haven't seen any indication is, uh, is either here or even on the, on the horizon. The IPCC also concluded that stabilizing it less than two is going to represent a, a genuine challenge and one that's 
that's deep enough that we ought to be preparing in terms of adaptation for warming that goes even over two. So uh, how do we do that? The first thing to remember is that we have a set of technologies now that are affordable, reliable, and in many cases uh, provide quality of life upgrades over the legacy technologies. Uh, energy, electricity from solar and wind are now cheaper almost everywhere than electricity from coal. Uh, we're beginning to see electric vehicles. This is uh, Chevy's new electric uh, Silverado pickup that are uh, meeting the desires uh, of consumers in a way that, that is also affordable and reliable, especially with the incentives that come with the Inflation Reduction Act. And uh, even in the area of things like electrifying homes, there's been a, a ton of evidence about the health consequences of, of gas ranges and transitioning to an induction range is a, is a way to uh, decrease greenhouse gas emissions. At the same time, it's, it's uh, relieving people of the health consequences of the, having the combustion products in their house. We, we also have a series of, of legacy technologies that often aren't recognized for the benefits they can provide in a, in a low or no greenhouse gas emission world. And that ranges from large-scale hydropower, the upper left image there is the Three Gorges Dam, to, um, to nuclear energy, which if it can be provided safely as an important source of reliable emissions-free energy, the Diablo Canyon power plant is the upper right image, to um, fossil fuel with carbon capture and storage, the image in the lower left is, um, is a coal-fired power plant in Manitoba that is scrubbing the majority of the CO2 that comes from the combustion and storing it permanently in geological formations. Or uh, electricity from biomass, and, and especially in Scandinavia, a significant fraction of the non-hydropower electricity is coming from burning biomass, primarily word chips, and that's another way to have close to greenhouse gas-free electricity. And all these are legacy technologies that have been around for some decades, but they really do provide a way to reinforce the new technologies with extra generation potential. Uh, one of the areas of friction that needs to be addressed is how you think about incorporating these legacy technologies, especially for industries like coal that have such a, a depressing history of environmental harms. We also are seeing really impressive progress in the move toward n negative emissions technologies, technologies that transfer carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into long-term storage. And that can be things that are as simple and well-validated as uh, increasing the area that's covered with forests or protecting the forests we have so that they can store more carbon. Um, there's exciting progress going on now about e e using uh, nature to make rocks that are built from carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And this is an example of, of spreading a volcanic rock on a field to uh, facilitate the conversion of that rock into, uh, into carbonates, into rocks that are taking CO2 from the atmosphere. The, um, the image on the upper right is a, is a direct air capture facility set up by a company called Climeworks. And we know a lot about how to grab CO2 from the air, compress it, and pump it into geological formations where it's stable for, for many centuries. So far, the um, direct air capture isn't, isn't close to affordable. But as was the case with the cost of photovoltaics, we're seeing real progress. And then the, the bottom image is uh, an ethanol plant in Decatur, Illinois that um, converts corn kernels into ethanol and in the process takes the one-third of the CO2 that's historically released and pumps that into long-term underground storage, meaning that even ethanol can be a negative emissions fuel. Uh, 
a, a wide range of these negative emissions are available, and it's really important for the overall structure of the solution that I want people to be aware of. But that doesn't mean we've solved all the problems, and, and there are at least five areas where we don't really have a set of mature technologies and where research from universities and national labs is, is incredibly important. And uh, those areas represent about well, a little more than 25% of our, of our total emissions. So things that really need work, and they include uh, long-term storage. And it's unlikely that, that batteries are going to be the path, but we're making huge progress on batteries, and, and it may be that they provide the answer to long-term storage. Industrial processes that are CO2 intensive, like, like making cement or making steel, are ones where we really don't have things that are close to affordable that, that um, look like they're going to work at scale. Aircraft travel only represents a, a few percent of emissions, but it's really hard to figure out how we're going to come up with emissions-free aircraft. And then agriculture, especially animal agriculture, is responsible for about 25 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. And we're seeing lots of interesting innovation in spaces like meat alternatives, but we really don't have a comprehensive solution yet to how we're going to eliminate greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. So, so what's the answer look like? I, I want to uh, suggest the, the Crisfield model of how the U.S. might decarbonize by 2050. And this is consistent with the president's goals, but in contrast to the way you typically hear about delivering climate solutions, this one doesn't have anything even approximating a, a single silver bullet that solves the problem. It's clear that we need to be making big investments in, in wind and solar, and wind and solar can accomplish a lot in terms of delivering large amounts of electricity, allowing us to electrify the things that aren't currently electrified. Um, but we still don't have the solution to what to do when the sun doesn't shine and, and the wind doesn't blow. F fossil with carbon capture and storage can be one way to have access to reliable energy 24-7, 365 days a year, as can, uh, as can nuclear energy. And I, I think there's going to be a, a place for both of those. I, personally, I think we're going to see some parts of the world that really embrace nuclear and expand it in coming decades, and many that don't. I, the, the third slice I have there is, is blue hydrogen, making hydrogen from natural gas, capturing the CO2 and putting it into permanent geological storage. The, the reason that I'm so optimistic about blue hydrogen is that once you've got hydrogen, you have access to a whole range of different technologies for either doing um, combustion or for synthesizing other kinds of hydrocarbons or for um, feeding the hydrogen back into a, into a fuel cell to make electricity. It's incredibly flexible, and I think especially by starting with hydrogen from natural gas, we open the doorway to what I have listed there as green hydrogen, making hydrogen from electricity through electrolysis so that we can capitalize on, on everything that hydrogen can do. My, my sense, for example, about aircraft is that we're likely to see the solution to aircraft not be electric airplanes, except maybe for short distance flights, but aircraft that run on what are often called sustainable aviation fuels. And I think those are going to be hydrocarbons, hydrocarbons that look like jet fuel, but are made from, uh, from blue or green hydrogen. And, and ultimately, I think the solution to a lot of these long-term storage problems and the manufacturing problems and the heavy transportation problems are going to be in, in what's often called solar fuels. That's using sunlight to make electricity, electricity to make hydrogen, and hydrogen to make the fuels that represent the solutions that we, that we need. Um, Manufacturing is a big challenge. I, I don't personally have as, as crisp a vision of, of how we'll decarbonize cement and steel, although 
having uh, abundant hydrogen is, is going to be a, a, a critically important enabler for that as for sustainable aviation fuels. Uh, the, the last one I put on there is, is animal agriculture and you know whether we do alternative meats or feed additives or switch away from meat-based diets, super hard to say. Uh, the, the, the reason I've drawn the figure like this is that I, I want to also emphasize that we don't need to do everything tomorrow. We can think about deploying each of these solutions as they become economically competitive and really deploying them uh, increasingly at scale over time so that we build out this portfolio of getting us to what I think of as a, a residual of you know, maybe 20% of the emissions that we don't deal with by 2050, but that are compensated by negative emissions technology. And the most attractive affordable of those currently is growing more forests. But we also have opportunities for making electricity from biomass and storing the, the uh, CO2 that's released. And we have uh, increasing opportunities for direct air capture, which I indicated is currently too expensive to consider, but isn't, it's not out of the question. Again, we don't need to deploy all those things immediately, but we need to be working hard now if we want to be able to deploy at scale by 2050, which is really just around the corner in terms of the time that's associated with developing these kinds of technologies. What might the world look like? Uh, the US uh, total emissions were about 6 billion tons of CO2 per year, a little more than 10% of the global level. And there are certainly countries that have the technology capacity and the financial resources and the flexibility to be on the same or even faster trajectory in the US, but many that don't. And my expectation is that if we compare with the US, uh, we're, we're not likely to see a real start at the global scale uh, for another several years, and that the finishing point is going to look more like the end of the century than, than the next few years. But this is a vision that's consistent with stabilization at or below two, roughly consistent with the goals of the Paris Agreement, although you know, nominally the Paris Agreement says well below 2C, and I, I, I think that will be a, a struggle to achieve. I, I want to close with, with just one set of comments about what we mean when we're talking about climate solutions. Are, are we really talking about something that's driven by governments, something that's driven by individual choices that people make? Are we talking about sacrifices, or are we talking about uh, supplementing existing energy resources with ones that are new and better? And there, there are certainly two perfectly legitimate pathways to decarbonization. Uh, one based on giving up on stuff we already have, on sacrifice, and one that's based on replacing legacy technologies with new non-emitting technologies. And, and I think there's a place for both of those. I, uh, among my students, many people really emphasize the, the personal sacrifice component, and I'm, I'm sympathetic to that, but I also see that as being really, really difficult to reconcile with the need to develop the durable political coalitions that we're going to need to sustain over decades if we're going to solve this problem. And, um, and I think it's going to be important to have both perspectives be vibrant, ongoing components of the solution. It also is, is important to recognize that around the world and around our country, there are incredibly uh, profound and important voices that are calling for justice in, in the delivery of climate solutions, not only in, in relief from climate damages, but also in recognizing who's caused the problems and, and what needs to be done in order to uh, address th those harms. And, and I think that that fits into uh, 
both the narrative of sacrifice and the narrative of driving new technologies, especially making the financial commitments to the new technologies. And, and I'm optimistic that we're seeing progress on climate justice. At the same time, we're seeing progress on the technology front. But I do think the big challenge we face is the challenge of maintaining a, a durable political coalition where progressives can be a part of the solution and feel that progress is being made. Conservatives can see opportunities for them. Uh, advocates for displaced workers can see that their concerns are being met. And, and uh, champions of the environment can see that their concerns are being met. I just want to speak uh, for one minute about the personal choices and, and where I've come down. So I, um, we have one uh, car in, in my family. It's, a, it's an electric vehicle, a Chevy Bolt, and a wonderful car. And I, I have personally found over the last 10 years that we've had electric cars in my household that they're uh, way better vehicles and way more fun to drive than, uh, than uh, internal combustion engine ones. Uh, personally, I, I I commute to work by bike, and recently I've switched to an e-bike, which I also want to advocate as being incredibly fun. Um, the outside of my house has the two compressors for the two heat pumps, one for the heating and cooling and one for the hot water. Uh, they really made a big positive impact on my, on my utility bill, and for, um, and for more than a dozen years we've had an induction cooktop, which has um, save me from the evils of uh, being exposed to nitric oxide from, from cooking inside the house. I, I did have a, a very harsh interaction with my graduate students when I was mentioning this trip yesterday. And they said, you're going to fly to Reno? And, uh, <laughs> and I, 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 I explained that I was uh, for two reasons. One, I wanted to be sure that I would be here and be able to to talk with all of you, but also to emphasize my commitment to providing um, pathways to solutions that allow us to accomplish the stuff that needs to be done. And if we start tying our hands behind the back, we're simply not going to be able to deliver. So in closing, I, I want to just uh, briefly mention that there are other options that people are talking about. Uh, one is just investing a lot more in adaptation and recognizing that we can cope with things like higher sea levels, higher temperatures by investing in combination of nature-based and technology-based solutions. Uh, this is the uh, um, flooding gates in the, in the Rotterdam Harbor in, uh, in the Netherlands, and, and they provide very effective protection against high sea level events. Uh, the other option that's increasingly on the table is, is that if we can't make fast enough progress on dealing with greenhouse gases, uh, we might use another pollutant, potentially sulfur dioxide in the stratosphere, to reflect sunlight in a way that, that decreases the damages. Uh, my personal feeling is we don't know nearly enough about solar geoengineering to advocate for it. And um, we also don't know enough to say that we should never consider it further. And, and I'm an advocate for doing the basic research to figure out whether or not it ought to have a place in the portfolio of options. So let me just close kind of where I began. I, I'm guardedly optimistic about the prospects for rapid progress on climate change, but it's going to require an all of the above approach to technologies, including technologies for adapting to the changes we can't avoid, as well as uh, mitigating the sources of greenhouse gas. And it also is going to require a social dynamic that brings everybody to the table. And if climate change is just about the progressives, or just about the energy company, or just about the displaced workers, we're not going to get to where we want to get. So. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. <laughs>